Good morning. I'm Kukla Vera. I'm the Director of External Affairs at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and to thank you all for taking time out of your schedules for a face-to-face -face discussion on the important issue of serious illness care. Uh, for those of you who are tweeters, please note that our hashtag is CA Serious Illness. It's on your program. And also, just as an informational point of view, what we are doing today's conference, um, it's being live streamed on Facebook. Along with the Schaefer Center, our conference today is hosted by Cedars Sinai. And the Cedars team is their example in, in serious illness care provision, their expertise and support have been pivotal in making our program happen, and I thank them all. I'm especially um, happy that we have uh, the Cedars CEO, Tom Prisilak, with us today, and he will be moderating our state panel. Our program has also been made possible through the support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, we thank them for that and for their ongoing expansive efforts to make high quality, community-based, serious illness care a reality. Today's program should bring glimmers of great hope given recent promising developments on both the federal and state levels regarding new care and payment models, and we'll be talking about many of these today. But on the flip side, great gaps continue with the care that people need and the care that they are actually receiving. So each of us here has a role to play in improving serious illness care, and this conference aims to help identify some of the steps that must be taken to do just that. So let's get going with the program. Um, I'm very pleased um, our first presenter who will speak next uh, will give us an overview on the national scene. Please note that in your program, uh, Leonard Schaefer was going to be providing uh, that presentation, but he had an emergency that uh, kept him in LA. But we are very, very fortunate to have June Simmons here, and she will provide us with the national overview. Ms. Simmons is the CEO and president of the Partners in Care Foundation, which she has led for over two decades. Under her leadership, they have developed scalable evidence-based care models for chronic illness and aging challenges. A social worker by training, Ms. Simmons served on the Consensus Committee on the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine that published the Dying in America report. She served in many capacities to help improve health outcomes. Among them, she was the, she's the co-founder of the National Evidence-Based Leadership Council. She also serves on the Los Angeles Alliance for Community Health and Aging and the board of the National Council on Aging. It is, I am very, very pleased and honored to introduce June Simmons. Ms. Simmons. It's an honor to be here and uh, I'm, um, I have a big topic to stand in with Leonard's slides on uh, short notice and so uh, it's been an exciting opportunity but this is such an important gathering and so I admire your heart for this critical component of the continuum of care uh, which as we look at the complexity, the slowness for change, the opportunities now for more rapid change uh, that address this essential area that, remember, these, these are points uh, where we, we have seen great and often avoidable suffering, where we have seen a dramatic need to expand informed uh, consent and understanding options, changing in clinical education and in patient understanding. Uh, it's such a, a costly uh, arena with such great opportunity, and yet uh, this late chapter in life that uh, ultimately everyone has an opportunity to travel uh, can be such a rich, uh, fruitful, meaningful, and therapeutic opportunity, I think. and so. So our work is about policy, it's about reimbursement, it's about changing behavior of human beings on the consumer side and the provider side. Uh, but, but really this is the heart of medicine, I think, is to bring this kind of comfort and supportive care and the opportunity to, to transform how we invest 
the amazing resources we put into the healthcare, the, the dollars and the human talent, and really uh, uh, change lives, uh, not just people who are near the end of life, but those around them. Uh, I'm gonna go this afternoon and visit a, a friend who I heard, you know, I, I need to get there uh, this afternoon, and you know, it's, it's just always so startling and so important uh, and such a time for bonding. So um, I was, I, I am a, trained as a social worker. I was at Huntington Hospital for a long time. So I've been watching this history, which more recently culminated in this, uh, probably you've seen this, Dying in America book, which is the more recent uh, uh, National Academies of, um, publication. And uh, uh, Leonard and I were two of the members that had the privilege of being on the work group. I don't know if you've been on a, what was then the Institute of Medicine on one of those work groups, but they're fantastic. You know, you, you work for a year. In this case, it was we had trouble coming to consensus about some of the very complex and sensitive issues, so we actually met, we had six meetings. Uh, coming to an actual publication and of course the uh, Institute of Medicine, now the National Academies, is the number one policy influencer. If anything will influence Congress at this time, which is a good question, uh, they are the trusted policy voice. And so um, this comes out of this long history, of course, in 1997 there was a, a publication like this, an early look at dying in America, followed then by a special look at pediatrics. Uh, and then uh, we, we thought in 2009 there was tremendous legislation to, to bring a way to pay for the conversation, to really mainstream this into medicine. And then, uh, I mean, we all know change is difficult. I'm sure you're all pioneers because you're here on cutting edge work. Uh, we saw the, um, the use of the term death panels take hold and freeze and reverse and still uh, all that work, pull it out of the Congress and uh, really set us back. So this was a, a, a very scary project uh, at, the, uh, at the Institute of Medicine. They were extremely worried. They had co-chairs. The uh, donor who paid for the work was anonymous, still anonymous, uh, and it, it uh, was hoped things would move forward. But uh, now, of course, we see that things are moving forward. There weren't a time of transformation, uh, of great opportunity in, in reshaping uh, the way we uh, invest in population health in America and the the changes that are possible. Uh, so Leonard's slides walk us through a little bit of that. Uh, this is the outline he, he provided, and I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have that nice beard, so I can't, can't claim that, but uh, I'm sticking to his slides as, as I was asked, and he's doing other important business, but I know this is deep in his heart. He is very committed to these transformational issues. So he wanted this, this history of, uh, of the work that's gone into the Dying in America uh, publication and initiative, and then to look at what's, what's happened. You know, that was, this came out in 2015. So um, what difference did it make? That you, you work on the work group, then you hope to spread the word and, and move out and be an influencer as, as the work continues to evolve. And, and unfold. Um, and so now, what is the uh, National Academy doing now? What are the legislations that are before us? And uh, what can we do then uh, to continue together to um, fight the good fight to, uh, to advance this work? What are the tools and uh, initiatives that we can support? So, looking then at, you know, how this has occurred because, of course, this issue since the last century, tremendous changes. We see now so much chronic uh, care, so many chronic conditions that are really driving 90% of the health care dollar and 
Um, it's become uh, more complex to predict when, how uh, the end of life should come, under what circumstances, with what resources, how, how do we educate professionals, uh, how do we uh, look at what are the true quality measures, how do we help consumers uh, to accept when they uh, maybe get notice. Of course, if it's sort of lucky if you get notice and you have some time to really uh, make sense of your life and do all the work you can with those, those you love and maybe those you should have loved better, and now you can make it right. Uh, but uh, science has, has really transformed the process, the choices, and the location, you know? At the beginning of the century, we certainly didn't have the ICU. And we, we now have 70% uh, of Americans who would uh, like to uh, die at home, and 70% of Americans don't. You know, they die in institutional settings. And so that's, that's a point of transformation that uh, is one of many factors that's influencing institutional care. But certainly, there seems to be growth as we see the, uh, the movement to really respect that uh, people should think about these issues ahead, that advanced care plans are really crucial, and how do we optimize, and who is it that can, should spend the time, and how is that time supported? It can't be a donation, of course, and how do we really mainstream truly authentic and effective work? When should people move to palliative care, which since the last century has been born, I think really born in the, you know, in the uh, late 90s, I know we began working with Kaiser on some of the early home palliative care work in uh, 1998. And uh, that work is still evolving. We, we see the CAPSI's work and we see palliative care in the inpatient setting as a consult, but then it ends and do those results hold? Uh, so we, we see the continuing effort to, uh, to learn and move. And of course, the cultural diversity, especially here in California, is a massive factor. Language interpreters who maybe uh, we say one thing and they tell the, the patient another. Uh, we've all seen these classic examples. Being able to understand the culture and what's permitted in the way of, of conversations. Uh, these, these are deep factors. Um, I, in Southern California, I, I, don't, I, I know California is diverse, but I know in Los Angeles County we have about a, 106 languages. And uh, so it, that and the cultures that, that accompany them so impact our, our need to know and the kinds of workforces we want to have in place. And of course, we all live with fragmentation. We were talking over uh, coffee earlier about the patchwork quilt we all try to wander through. Uh, you almost have to be a chameleon, you know, you can change colors. You, you don't want to do a wild wallet biopsy. You don't want to decide what someone gets because of whether they're insured, how they're insured, who, which network, are they in network or out of network. It's, uh, it's an amazing, uh, complicating factor for all of us, but, but we know these underlying principles uh, remain, and we need to get all of those systems to um, to accommodate. And there's a lot of legislation, as you'll see, that's uh, looking in that direction uh, to move us. And of course, we have gotten the pulsed, we've got the mulsed, we've got uh, the uh, physician-assisted suicide or death entrance way uh, that may be controversial, but has you know, been bold uh, advance in looking at patient preferences. We see Providence with their Institute for Human Caring looking at system-wide uh, shift to really engage and build in uh, uh, the elicitation of patients' goals and preferences. We see Sutter with very creative work, you know, many of you uh, all leading in these directions, and yet uh, 
we can see the, the bold leader who can articulate the change, and we all know when we go to the line level and we try to get it implemented, um, it's an exciting uh, challenge. It's not exactly like having a teenager and thinking if you say clean your room once that they will. <clears throat> You do have to repeat yourself. Change does take this tremendous amount of, of repetition, but it's, um, it's so important, and we do see it moving forward. And so getting uh, quality measures, getting transformed reimbursement, getting new laws and policies is critical, uh, and transforming the way we educate professionals and the public is critical. So in those wonderful debates that we had at the National Academy with a range of disciplines and uh, experts in the field and looking at all the research and all the literature and uh, arguing through, uh, we ended up saying we thought as a group that there were five key areas that uh, were critical to this transformation of uh, care for people with serious illness and likely end of life care. So now it seems there's growing familiarity and comfort with the delivery of person-centered, family-oriented care. Um, I know in Southern California, the Hospital Association is working with the, the SCAN Foundation and they have a whole initiative and I've been having the pleasure of being on the advisory board. It's been so interesting to see how at the C-suite level, there's this kind of shared vision and buy-in to these better care, lower cost, more, uh, more broad-based um, uh, consistency in how we approach these issues. And, yet, and then the search to find specific hospitals that would launch projects and then to see could they succeed in even a small test of change to build integrated care around person-centered, person-directed, family-oriented care and uh, the rate of change and the obstacles that people face at that level are, are really fascinating. And um, so it's one thing to decide to set a course to create a path. It's another to fully install it in a meaningful daily way as a working standard of care. Uh, so uh, then the clinician patient communication advanced care planning clearly, clearly uh, in, is critical professional education and development, as we said, uh, the policies and payment systems drive us all uh, up and down, and then public education engagement, so, so vital. So the recommendations then that came out of this, uh, you can see here, uh, and again, it seems like it wouldn't be rocket science, but getting agreement on these from all perspectives, that they're practical, doable, that they're lofty enough, but uh, achievable. Um, so thinking that we can actually get public and private payers and, and delivery organizations to really cover comprehensive care and define comprehensive care as a lofty goal in our wildly complex multi-payer, multi-provider, but now consolidating, uh, you know, maybe all the consolidation we're seeing who thought CVS would buy health plans? I mean, it's a, it is a startling notion, uh, but maybe having bigger systems will make it easier to get consistency across practice. Certainly, we've seen Sutter grow from Sutter to, what, nine counties now? I mean, we have these massive systems. So, and then I think, you know, professional societies are critical. They play a, a really crucial role, as, as should others in establishing the quality standards. We're living in the age where measurement is so powerful that it can really help us. That's really a lot of what's driving this, I think, is the new ability and the increasingly uh, effective ability to measure quality standards. Now, of course, education, uh, you know, we, we need to look, there's a lot of debate about 
what you can require, how much curriculum can you stuff into one student in, in one educational course, which are the critical priorities. And then integrating financing, we've seen in California the effort to do the duals. Didn't, you know, now we have Medicare here and Medi-Cal there and Medi-Cal's managed, but did they really integrate? No, you know, so can we really, really get to integration of these new components uh, and then, um, you know, really helping the public to get it. There's lots of efforts in that direction, but more are needed. So what progress has been made? There's been a lot of continuing effort because there's, it's a big deal to do one of these, but the whole point is to achieve change. And so how do you continue to drive change when you have uh, an inspiring, a comprehensive um, triptych pathway vision guide from someone like the National uh, Academies? So uh, we can see there has been some progress. We, we see shifts in care delivery, not comprehensive, none, not, you know, not all in place. Still, progress, um, communication uh, that has definitely become much more normative in our expectations. And uh, professional education and development, you can see uh, really fairly noteworthy progress in that, and public education as well. So where's the shortfall? Policies and payment systems. This is where we really need the advancements to occur, and they're underway in these kind of where are we going, which direction are we going today kind of world. There seem to be some dramatic uh, opportunities to move forward. Uh, we see already CMS is uh, reimbursing for advanced care planning and the Part B, uh, they've expanded that, even can use alternative workforces for that. Uh, nurse and social worker visits during the last week of life. The Medicare Advantage plans, those will be transformational with the supplemental benefits. Probably not so much in 2019 because, you know, it's too fast. But uh, there'll be a swirl, there is a swirl, I think, to think, what does this mean and what can we do to really integrate social services, health care, the payments, really address the social and behavioral determinants of health. That's what our work at Partners in Care is all about, trying to bring home and community-based services, what happens at home and self-management to bear. So, and then in 2018, some improvements in in rates, wow, oh boy, we got a raise. So that, well, but money drives a lot. Measurement attached to money, whoosh, big change initiative. So, uh, and the legislation, of course, the Chronic Care Act, massively important. Shocking, you know, we went to sleep one night with no government, we woke up the next morning with the Chronic Care Act and a lot of dramatic opportunities that we need to seize, when the, which it does extend the Medicare Advantage special needs plan as well, which is kind of under the radar, but I think a very important opportunity along with the supplemental plans. And then, of course, the uh, Family Caregivers Act uh, as well. So these are important zones. So now there is select legislation before us. So if we're warriors <clears throat> on a path for favorable change to ease suffering by enhancing care and payment, these, you could, you could take one, you could take them all, but you or those who are the advocates in, in your major systems, you have the ability to craft voices to move change forward uh, through uh, helping properly shape these initiatives and to really advance their adoption and then their implementation. You know, once these changes happen, which we all need to help with, you get to install them. So that's perfect. That's like saying I believe in the electric car versus I bought a Tesla and I'm driving it. You know, it's a important to let that rubber hit your road. So I think these are very important opportunities. And uh, 
and then the uh, National Academy continues to, uh, to advance work in new ways. So, you know, you have the big effort of the work group, and then they have smaller initiatives that we can all be part of or easily access uh, these round tables on uh, quality care for people with serious illness. They're doing a series of those. So you can participate in them, can be in the invite in the room, but they also are all broadcast. There are open telephone lines for these, and they're all recorded. So, you know, given that calendaring is the hardest thing in the world these days, uh, these can be listened in your uh, second shift at midnight when you feel like you just really want something interesting on this topic to, uh, to talk you to sleep. They are, um, they are very important uh, advances of the best thinkers and articulators in our country, moving this discussion and dialogue forward, and so I think uh, you may want to hear them, but I mean, they're easy to share. Now that we can just blast, e-blast people and just say, here's something, we can use them to educate. We can uh, much more broadly educate in our settings with these kinds of uh, ready-made tools that are available for us. And so I think as we continue as influencers, as shapers, as role models, as visionaries bringing change forward, uh, we have some of these new tools. They have other kinds of recent workshops and presentations we can draw from. So we have a little virtual university of, uh, of educational tools that, that we can use. And there's one coming up in July. So whether you were going to attend it or you're going to inspire others to spend their time, here we have uh, what's near and dear to my heart integration, uh, an easy word but a hard concept to implement, but where we really need to go, how do we really integrate healthcare and social services? In the office, in the clinic, in the hospital, sure, in the health plan, but in the home. So if I were uh, able to really <clears throat> uh, speak about our work, that's, those are the models that at Partners in Care we really want to advance to bring non-clinical uh, people who are, who are, we think, a missing specialty that are a true addition uh, to the uh, delivery of population health. Uh, and those are groups when there's not a skilled need in the home, but you have a complex individual who really needs help in advanced care planning, uh, starting that conversation in uh, addressing the social determinants of health and figuring out what to do because there's a lot of depression, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, nutritional insecurity, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of uh, tremendous stresses on people as they, they face the impact on their lives of having a serious illness for themselves or someone they love. Uh, then those social services turn out now with new measurement. Uh, these are uh, Leonard's slides, or I'd have the one up there that shows that uh, environment and individual behavior are massively important in driving health outcomes across a population. And those are things we need to invest in. And there are some great uh, small dose interventions with high yield. So all of this work around uh, integration of healthcare and social services, to me, is an inspiring new horizon that's really coming to be, especially under the Medicare changes. So here's what we want. We want patients respected. We want crises prevented. You know, we don't want to wait till people are the wreck of the Hespers and then invest huge amounts of energy and resources in them. Let's smooth that out. Let's Let's see if we can avoid a lot of that suffering. Uh, and that, we believe, can be paid for from the savings of doing it differently. When we make alternative investments in the way we deliver care in these new person-centered and fully integrated social behavioral health determinants and all the wonders of medicine, we save huge amounts of money 
uh, that can invest in that front end and really support better quality of life, uh, which is the dream of all of us, right? We want to ease suffering. We want to enhance quality of life. We want better care, better costs. So thank you for leading. And um, I see your 30-second notice, and I, I, can, I can meet that standard. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.